thank you for coming. I know that uh, this is a difficult time of year to have these type of events, but we feel that um, it would be it was important to have a discussion, a presentation, and answer as many questions as we're able to answer about uh, safety uh, in our school and town and buildings. Um, I'm uh, John Darby, superintendent of schools. We're actually going to have other members of the town and, and school present this evening. And we're just going to do a quick introduction of, of different people so you know who they are when they come up. Um, do you want to just to introduce who you are? Hi, I'm Lieutenant Christine Amadol. I'm a support services uh, division commander for the RPD, so I run all the trainings. Uh, I'm Lieutenant uh, Richard Roddy and a school resource officer for the Boston Protection Division. Good evening, Brian Lewis, school resource officer. Mark Sagalogy, Bobler Lasher, town manager. Hi, Greg Burns, my chief. And we, we also have members here from our facility department, um, finance office as well. Um, and really the, the purpose of this evening is to, to give you an overview of the types of things that we have been working on for the last several years and things that we're going to be doing looking forward. Um, just as a you know a heads up, there are there's a lot there are some things we can't discuss this evening because it involves safety and security and we can't go into great detail about in, in some areas. So um, if we say to you, unfortunately, we can't go any further into that topic, it's, it's really because it, we have the best interest of everyone in mind, um, so we're not able to. But we will try as much as possible to, to give you information this evening on what's going on. So here's some of the things we're going to be talking about. Um, we're going to talk about some of the highlights of school safety. Uh, we're going to spend some time on that, which involves also the state requirements. We work very closely with police and fire. And, um, we're going to talk a lot about that. Um, school security, some of the things that are in place, the role of the school resource officer, and fortunately, uh, with the, the ballot question passing in April, we now will have a second school resource officer in our, in our schools. Talk a little bit about social emotional learning because that plays a key part in, in the overall psychological safety of our, of our uh, students and staff. The trainings that we go through, uh, and then looking ahead, what are the next steps? Um, we're also going to talk a little bit about facilities and one of the things that's been happening behind the scenes is a town and school building security study, uh, which we'll talk a little bit about. Um, we want to tell you a little bit about Alice. You probably have heard a lot about lockdowns and things like that when, when school shootings are, are talked about in, in, the, in the media. So we want to talk a little bit about what is Alice uh, so we can have a baseline knowledge and the types of trainings that we do. And then Chief Sagala and his staff are going to talk about some of the active shooter trainings that they do um, in the community, and there's going to be one coming up that they're going to be doing in, in one of our schools after school is over. So some of our highlights, we have a very strong collaboration with police, fire, town, running coalition against substance abuse. I, I've said this many times in public presentations, and I know Chief Sagala and Chief Burns have as well. Um, we have a very uh, unique collaborative relationship. I talk to a lot of superintendents and they don't have as strong of a relationship in some communities with their uh, fire chief and police chief um, as we do here in Reading. And I think that's something that really has helped with communication over the years and planning. We belong to the STARS and like Regional Emergency System, um, which is a, a way to access additional resources in the case of an emergency, which is obviously extremely important. Uh, we have a, a memorandum of understanding in place with police and the district attorney's office, so we have a, a flow of information going back and forth so that we can make sure that um, nothing falls through the cracks. Uh, we, there are monthly community-based justice meetings, which I know uh, school administrators and Brian Lewis, our school resource officer, attend with the district attorney's office. We were talking about different issues so that everyone has a heads up. Um, the school administration, the school committee, and the town um, officials are on the ARCASA board. And we have safety plans in place. Both, we are required by state to have safety plans, but we had safety plans as well um, before it became a mandate from the state. And these are slated to be reviewed again this summer. The schools participate in six drills, a minimum of six drills a year uh, per school. Two ALICE drills, four evacuation, fire evacuation drills, one shelter in place drill. 
At times, also, our high school has had canine searches as part of that. And then every few years, we've also had a multi-school evacuation drill. A few years ago, we had uh, a full evacuation drill happen during school time uh, for the campus, campus high school, Birch Meadow Coolidge, uh, which involved uh, DPW, fire, police, our bus company, and how and going to a, a secondary evacuation site in case there was some sort of emergency in this in this area, and we needed to evacuate the, the students, the staff. Uh, as quickly as possible. So a little bit about the state requirements. We are required to have a multi-hazard evacuation plan, and each year it's reviewed before the school year. I sit down with the fire chief, police chief, and, and other officials, and we talk about um, what's in the plan and, and moving forward, what are the types of trainings and requirements are needed. Uh, the best response for any of the things that we're talking about is effective planning, and that is the whole key to this. It's, it's the drills that you do, it's the communication methods, um, all of that is really important. I'll give you one quick example. As many of you know, last Friday we had um, a shelter in place after school on a Friday afternoon, uh, which is, you know, a unique time, an unusual time to have a shelter in place. And we, we talked that we met this week, we talked about the things that worked, the things that did not work as well, and the things that we need to put in place before the next, the next situation. So it was a really good um, opportunity to, to take a look at the different, the different aspects of what was going on during that. Also as part of state requirements, we have fire evacuation drills. They must be conducted on a regular basis, at least four times a year and within the first three days of school. Um, so, Every year we, we develop what's called a safety calendar, uh, which we work very closely with fire and police on. And we, in that calendar, we, we prescribe when the different drills are going to uh, occur. So during each month, uh, there, there are different types of drills depending on the time of year. Uh, what we, what the, the, the fire department does uh, very well is they don't just do regular standard fire drills. They, they, they try at times to create unique situations um, because it isn't going to be a regular fire evacuation situation if it was a real, a real thing. So sometimes it could be during lunchtime, uh, which is a very chaotic time. And how would we handle that? Or they may close down a primary fire escape. And so how do you, how do you know how to go through a secondary route? So all of those things are part of our drills and the types of questions that our staff are looking at as as they go through those drills. Um, the multi-hazard evacuation plan does include things like lockdown drills or ALICE drills. Um, but we, should, we have a plan in place when um, for things such as fires, hurricanes, other hazardous storms or disasters. Uh, there's no state requirement for, for ALICE drills. Um, there is a state requirement for fire drills. So I, I think that's an important distinction. We have chosen as a school district to do two Alice drills a year, to do um, shelter in place drills um, two a year. I'm sorry, one a year. So those are things that we feel are important to do on a regular basis so that our students and staff are prepared uh, in case there is an emergency. In terms of school security, there, again, this is the planning phase, putting, putting some things in place. Um, these are things that we are constantly reminding staff about and having conversations with. Our schools have uh, safety committees. Excuse me, Dr. Dryden, I'd like to call the select board to order. Sure. Sorry. That's okay. <laughs> so we, um, we, have, uh, we constantly have communication to make sure that uh, we have school security procedures in place. Uh, so for example, at our elementary schools, uh, actually at all our schools, the, the, uh, we have visitor entrance procedures when people come in. The elementary schools actually, are, their, their buildings are locked from 7 a.m. to 6 p.m. due to the extended day programs, and we have someone manning uh, the main office during those times and will buzz people in uh, once people have asked a series of, of questions. All exterior doors are locked during the school day in all schools. Each school has security alarm and cameras in place. And the modular classrooms, which we have six in the district, have extra security measures. 
In terms of a facility review, in 2016, our facilities department um, did an extensive environmental re review of all of the exterior parts of the building to make sure that we didn't have excessive shrubs or trees that are blocking windows, things like that, things that could uh, get in the way of uh, some sort of uh, security breach. Uh, those areas were addressed over a two-year period as part of that study. And the Facilities Department has also been working very closely to address physical plant issues when they come about. So things like door repairs, key policy and procedures, and cameras and security alarms. We have, we have an excellent Facilities Department that when there are issues, they address them immediately uh, and take care of them. As part of this also, we have been working very closely for the last few years on a town and school building security center. Town meeting approved funding a few years ago uh, to hire a consultant to go through all of our town and school buildings um, and come up with a series of recommendations, both from an infrastructure standpoint and from a policy and procedure standpoint. Those things have begun to be implemented, um, particularly the policy and procedure end of it. Obviously, a lot of this it requires funding, but some of it is in place. So, for example, phase one, uh, which was, is funded by town meeting, is to renovate the police station dispatch center. Um, that's going to be work that's going to go through spring of 2019. The phase two piece are specific areas in each town and school building through the security study that are infrastructure based that are going to. Um, be looked at as part of a long-range plan to, to implement. So $4 million in capital was approved by town meeting in the spring of 2018, but the dates of the implementation have not yet been decided. Um, there is a bond bill that exists right now in the Senate, in the House. Um, it's $3 million earmarked for safety, uh, safety and security for, um, for reading. It's, it's, it's earmarked for reading, which would certainly help with phase two funding. Um, so that so that's something that keep your fingers crossed and maybe something that we may be able to access and then in the summer of 2018 there'll be further planning and then uh, we are also going to be reviewing all of our safety plans for the for the schools want to talk a little bit about the school resource officer we've had the 10 years rich 10 years we've had school resources a little bit longer, a little bit longer. Um, School Resource Officer has been in our, our district for over 10 years um, and has really become a key part of um, the culture of our school district, particularly here at the high school, but the School Resource Officer is not just here at the high school, which I think any School Resource Officer can attest to has been in the role. Um, you can see here they're responsible for all the calls for uh, the service of the, school, the rent schools and for Austin Prep. Um, they are our communication liaison. So when we have uh, any type of uh, issue regarding that would involve law enforcement, um, we go to the school resource officer. They are our, um, our, our communication link. They, they're a role model, they're a teacher, act as an advocate for students, family, faculty, and staff. Um, officer Lewis is very visible in the schools. He's very visible at, at events uh, in the public where He's, he's presenting to schools on a variety of topics. He's a member of the ARCASA um, board, attends those meetings. Um, he works very closely with school administrators to determine the best course of action when there is a situation. And so obviously, the ultimate goal of the school resource officer is to improve the safety of the schools, which also improves the learning environment of, of our schools. Um, and as I said earlier, we're going to have Two school resource officers starting next school year. Uh, one officer Lewis will be here at the high school, and the second school resource officer, which is they're in the process of hiring, um, will be at uh, at Parker Middle School. The school resource officer also is an Alice instructor, member of the Stars and Emlet team, certified youth mental health youth mental health first aid instructor, uh, member of the Middlesex Partnership for Youth. Um, Previous school resource officer Mike Mulo was involved in the development of the Nemlec Safety Kit, uh, which is now used in the whole Nemlec region um, for school-based emergencies, and also participates, as I mentioned earlier, in the community-based justice program. A little bit about social-emotional learning. This has been a district goal uh, for the last 
uh, three years, but it's something that we have taken very seriously for the last several years in terms of the types of steps that we've been taking. We formed a task force in 2011 um, that used a, a behavioral health tool uh, that the state provided. We went through all of those steps. We did a gap, what's called a gap analysis of the areas that we were strong in and the areas that we were not strong in. And we started developing an action plan. And from that action plan emerged this district goal where we have been implementing different steps um, throughout the last several years. Each level has what is called social emotional learning curriculum and practices that we've been using. We have a behavioral health coach that works with us, it works with the teachers, works with the uh, students at each level to help implement these um, areas. Uh, at the elementary level, we have open circle and positive behavioral intervention and supports. These are, these are the names of programs. At the middle school, we have a program called Facing History in Ourselves during the advisory period, which is a small group uh, time for adults and students to connect together to build those relationships which are extremely important so that students feel that they can go to uh, an adult when there is a crisis, when they know something about a friend that that, that friend is going to need some help. Um, we also have done uh, activities called Challenge Day where our entire 8th grade participates in a day-long activity with follow-up activities on uh, building unity and community. Um, the World of Difference, which is by the Anti-Defamation League, um, we have a World of Difference club actually at the middle school and at the high school. Um, and that, that's a group that obviously looks at ways to, uh, for, to accept differences um, among, among different students. And then the high school has specific guidance, guidance curriculum to each grade uh, that also focuses on the social emotional learning piece. So those are all things that we're doing at each level. In addition, each school has at least one school psychologist available. The district has three social workers uh, which work with students available. And we also have access to mobile crisis unit in case there is a student that is having some real difficulty and needs immediate um, help. We also collect a lot of data. And the purpose of collecting the data is to identify areas where we feel we need to strengthen. Uh, this is part of our district improvement plan each year. Um, every other year we give the youth risk behavior survey, grades 6 through 12, so that we can identify what are the risky behaviors that our students are being exposed to. And we also compare ourselves to state, regional, and national data to see are, are we consistent with trends or is there an area of concern that we need to worry about. One of the biggest areas right now that we're dealing with is vaping. Um, and this is, this is a regional trend, actually, it's probably a national trend. Um, there's a lot of, of vaping going on, uh, with, particularly with high school age students. The opposite years of the Youth Risk Behavior Survey, we're doing the Pride Survey, which is a school climate survey, which helps us measure the climate of our schools. And that is both a student um, survey, but it's a teacher and a parent survey as well. And this month, um, and into June, our parents, students, and teachers will be taking that survey. We look at attendance, we look at tardiness, we look at what is called office discipline referrals for major infractions to see if there are spikes and when they occur and in what classes and is there something we can do to reduce those numbers. Um, obviously we have teacher observation. We do also a process called the ESPER where um, our school nurse works very closely with our CASA um, staff uh, to screen students. It's a, it, it, it's a drug screening tool that is used. Um, and it's required now as part of the opioid bill at the state level, and we do this in grades 9 and 11 for students that may be in crisis. We also have a very strong chemical health policy, which the school committee has reviewed on a regular basis, and we work closely with those students who violate the chemical health policy. Um, and then certainly we use information from police. We work, as I said, very closely with the police and our school resource officer. In terms of training, obviously we take our training with, on school and uh, safety very seriously. 90% of our staff are trained in youth mental health first aid. Um, think of regular first aid. This is, for, this is first aid for students that, that may have some behavioral, social, emotional difficulties and how you can identify that early enough so that you can get that student some help. 
We also make this as a prerequisite training now for all of our new teachers. 30 of our teachers have now completed the Leslie coursework on trauma-sensitive practices. Uh, it's a very rigorous program that looks at how trauma impacts students in our schools and how we can address um, getting them the support that they need. Uh, we've also had several staff attend and present workshops on social-emotional learning topics. I'm a member of the Safe and Supportive Schools Commission, which is, was enacted by the state legislature. Police, fire, and schools have participated in joint training sessions um, by NEMLAC and state last year. Um, we attended a, a, a training summit at uh, Endicott College um, where we actually heard a variety of guest speakers, including uh, a mother whose child died at Sandy Hook uh, Elementary School and, and the types of things that she learned and Sandy Hook learned from that experience. And then uh, my association, the Massachusetts Association of School Superintendents, has focused a significant amount of professional development on this topic for superintendents so that they can go back and work with their staff on how do we, how do we improve the safety and security, both the psychological and, and the physical safety and security of our, of our students. Looking ahead, as I mentioned earlier, we're going to have the town school building security study implementation, which is going to be completed in the fall. Um, which was completed in the fall. We're reviewing all of our safety plans this summer. We're having a safety committee put in place, which is going to involve police, fire, and schools to make sure that we're, we're doing the things that are state-of-the-art and, and up to current research. And there'll be a different, additional staff safety training throughout the next school year. We're going to work very closely with police and fire um, to see if it's, it's feasible to have another campus type evacuation drill, probably do something uh, on the west side of town this time, where, where we did one in this campus, we'll do one more on the west side of town um, for those areas. So I'm going to stop here with you a lot, I have a lot of information, take questions, I'm going to take in natural breaks, opportunities for you to ask questions. Yes. Hi. If um, you could just say who you are, because we are being uh, broadcast. Uh, I'm Caitlin Mercurio and I'm a parent. Um, so I, several months ago, I know an issue came up in North Reading, so I'm just going to use this as an example because it's right next door, um, where a student saw something concerning on social media. Wasn't enough, I don't believe, to like have the student arrested, but it was enough to cause concern to the student. So let's say that happens in Reading, and I'm a student, and I see something. Could you walk me through what I do and what the response would be? Sure. Uh, so, <clears throat> oh, actually, I don't know. I guess you need to because <laughs> that way. So, what would happen in that situation would be the question was if something was posted on social media that doesn't necessarily rise to the level of a crime, but. Uh, was concerning amongst, amongst the student population. Uh, what happens is usually a student will report that to a, a faculty or staff member or bring it to the attention of the school. School then reach out to me um, and we, even though we know it's not a crime, we want to make sure, or we might not know it's a crime at, at first, uh, we just want to make sure that we get to the bottom of why that student posted that photo and speak with that student and their family and make sure that they are 100% uh, safe and not uh, looking to cause harm to anyone else or themselves. Um, we do an investigation, we go to their house, we speak, interview them and their parents. Oftentimes we ask for consent to search their house to make sure there are no weapons or firearms uh, that, could, that they could potentially use to harm anyone. And then we follow back up and obviously relay that back to the school, the, the superintendent, uh, police chief, and lieutenant of the body. If I can just add yeah, one, one piece to that. One of the things, schools do play a role, but have a limited role depending on if it impacts the school. So legally, we cannot get involved unless it's a, we can make a connection back to school and as a disruption in the school. So sometimes parents say, well, how come you're not dealing with this? If it, if it doesn't enter the school, there isn't, sometimes there are things we can't do about it. We can certainly make, be aware of it, we can certainly keep an eye on it, we inform the police, as, as we mentioned, but there has to be a nexus or a connection back to the school. Can you give an example of a nexus or a connection back to the school, hypothetical or real world? 
Uh, so say if, uh, for instance, if a student posts a photo of them holding an airsoft uh, pistol on Instagram or Snapchat, um, and the students, you know, with maybe a lyric to a, a rap song underneath it that if you don't, or if you're not familiar with the rap song, you might not know particularly what that student meant by it. Um, so if that comes to the attention of the, the school and I think that's the nexus that we're looking for. If students bring that forward to the school, and usually it's more than one, uh, that becomes the nexus that the school will inform me. And even if it's just one student, they'll tell me anyways, and we'll investigate it. Um, so does it go the other way too? So let's say it has nothing to do with the school, but a particular individual has repeated, I, I don't want to call them offenses, <clears throat> but things of concern that happen around the town, maybe through sports, maybe at the park or whatever, um, that are picked up by the police, or the police communicating it back to the school to say, we're having issues with you know, this handful, this handful of students. Yeah, absolutely. Every every day when I come in, I check the log, and the first thing I do is look for any student involvement with the police. Um, and this is every pretty much every community. So if another community has a contact with a Reading student that got pulled over for maybe possessing uh, alcohol in, say, Wilmington, they'll call us and let us know. I'll then tell the school. We do the same thing for Snapchat, Instagram, and any social media stuff that might be alarming to us. I, I tell the school about car accidents that the students are in. Um, even if they're not the driver, they're the passenger, and we have it in our log, I share that information. Yeah, I have actually two questions. Sure. Linda, can you stand up? Okay. Linda Snowdown, officer, school committee, uh, Beaver Road. Um, okay, cool. my, my first question is, I know there are a lot of rules about what can be reported back, and what I hear a lot from people is, how do I know anything was done? And I know there are rules about what can be reported by the schools about the follow-up. And I was just wondering if you could talk a little bit about the rules that bound the communication. And then the second question is about um, ways that, actual ways that students can report concerns that might protect their anonymity if they're worried about that. So as far as sharing information about juveniles, juveniles are very well protected under Massachusetts law for a very good reason. Just because you're an offender as a juvenile doesn't mean you're going to turn out to be a bad person in the long run. Um, so we can't disclose any juvenile uh, outcomes to the public. I believe, is that correct, Lieutenant? Um, so we, we will update the school, but obviously we cannot legally release uh, any findings to that. But if there was a concern that we thought would uh, impact the school, we would obviously would take action. The school would either close down or um, put out a, a notice to everyone. And, and that's part of that memorandum of understanding that we, I talked about earlier. From a school perspective, a student record, discipline is a student record. With, and we cannot share student record with the general public. So that would be a violation of FERPA, which is the Family Education Records Privacy Act. Uh, so <coughs> we can't even, when it comes to a, a bullying issue or something like that, we can't even share information that way with victims or targets and, um, or um, aggressors um, because that would be a violation of, of uh, FERPA. And if a student wants to make a report, they can always uh, report it via our text tip line, which is anonymous. They can also call our business line, which uh, they can also remain anonymous if they want to, and they can always approach a trusted adult within the schools, myself, any, any, basically anyone within the community that has ties to school will eventually channel it up to, to me and uh, any uh, supervisor in the school. Is there, sorry, is there any communication back with the original reporter that the investigation has taken place? No other information, but just sort of a reassurance that they were heard an investigation has taken place. We can't tell you more except that you were heard. I believe most, most of the time we will do that because if it's a student, they'll be aware. But if they're anonymous, obviously we can't get back to that an no, anonymous okay. source. But if we know who the student is, they'll know we're, we're looking into it. Yeah, I was just going to follow up. Oh, I'm Debbie Hattery. I have two boys at the high school, two girls at the middle school. You were talking about social media. Um, do you actually monitor the social media of the students? Do you have a way of doing that? Or do you rely solely, if you see, if you, if there's something troubling, do you rely solely on a student coming to a trusted adult or calling a tip line? 
It's difficult to monitor uh, kids' social media because a lot of kids have it protected so it's not open to the public and only students or people that they accept as friends will be able to see what they're posting. Um, I do try to go on social, social media and see what kids are posting but again it's very difficult because the kids are taught by their parents at a young age uh, general internet safety tips which are don't accept people you don't know and don't post things that you shouldn't so and don't have contact with strangers so it's, it's difficult in that manner but what was your second part of your question? Uh, just wondering how often that happens too. Where you know, kids are actually coming to trusted adults if they do see something. Fairly often, yeah. I mean. It, and, there, and so they don't fear no. repercussions from other students finding out? Or and especially in this day and age, uh, the students here are really good about bringing that to our attention because no one wants to have an unfortunate event like uh, in Florida or, or uh, Texas happen here. So kids are pretty good about informing someone within the building. Just talk one second about the, the social media. They, there are tools that exist that allow you to look at you know, social media sites, but there are some restrictions. So for example, if the site is private, the tool doesn't work. Also, you, re, you need someone at the other end to be monitoring it, which that's a labor intensive, and unfortunately, we just don't have the resources and the staffing to be able to do that. But as Brian said, a lot of times kids have their social media private so the tool doesn't really work. Vanessa Lerano, Select Board. An email came through to the Select Board asking about what measures are in place um, during lockdown um, uh, or shelter in place for children that have either medical conditions or allergies of some kind. Yes, I, I received that email also. Oh, okay. <laughs> And I believe the email asked us to take a look at what we're going to be doing. So we will take a look at that. Thank you. There isn't, during lockdowns and shelter in places, there isn't a lot of food available. When we have strict allergy policies and guidelines in place in our schools to begin with, those policies would remain in place because school is in session during those, those times. But we'll certainly look at that to see if there's anything that we need to look at differently. So you mentioned the chemical health policy violations, and I'm just wondering if you can talk a little bit about the safety, the protections built in for the kids that have had, that have, have violated the rules. That I know suspensions are one repercussion. Re, re, thank you, repercussion. Um, but if there's a how, what safeties are built in for so those kids? Suspensions aren't necessarily this is one of the consequences. This is, the chemical health policy is for extracurricular activities <coughs> and athletics. That's the policy, that, the school committee policy that exists. What we're not, so if there is a violation of that policy, and it doesn't have to be on school grounds, it could be outside of school grounds, it could be gone a weekend, it could be during the summer, um, then there are certain things that are put in place as consequences. And this isn't just a school committee policy. I, and we, the MIAA, the Massachusetts Interscholastic Athletic Association, has a set of rules for chemical health violations. We've actually taken it a couple steps further. And we work very closely with, with uh, police uh, and school administration on you know, the identification, but also the education piece if the student does violate the policy. So if you violate the policy the first time, I can't remember off the top of my head what, how many games, but there's so many games of suspension, students are allowed to practice. If you violate it, and you have to go to an education class, which our ACASA staff do provide. If there's a second violation, the number of games increases, and they have to get additional education. If there's a third violation, there's a longer suspension of, of at games or at, at, at extracurricular activities. So the policy is pretty specific um, as to you know what what the steps are, and you know part of this is also to try to get the student help. Um, it's not just to punish them. That's not the goal of this. Um, obviously, we don't want students uh, involved in chemical health violations. So. I just follow up on that. 
So I, I'm familiar with that policy, and I thought it also applied for in-school violations. Like if someone were caught with something in school, then there would be repercussions. No, that's a separate. That's that's in the student handbook. There were specific consequences for violations on school grounds. One of those slides you mentioned, uh, I saw Austin Prep up there, and I guess I, maybe I should have been aware of that. I wasn't aware of that. Uh, and I guess I'm trying to get a sense for our bandwidth and, and what actually we're providing to Austin Prep. That's the school. Oh, that's that's the school resource officer. We are okay. So we're. So maybe that's yeah, so I cover Austin Prep like I would uh, any other school here in in town. I have a question, Barry Brown Software. Um, does Austin Prep kind of contribute to the writing budget for our resources as thin as they are? Um, why would we be covering a private school which doesn't contribute to the tax base of that? Yeah, and I, I didn't bring, bring in the money. money. I, I didn't well, well, <laughs> She's a gal. I think you're out here. My ears perked up on that so I think that was a long-standing thing before I became chief with Chief Cormier. And quite honestly, I think we look at it as they're still part of our community, whether they're here during the day. And we don't, we're not as involved as we are here at this school. However, we, they have any issues or concerns, they do call us. And just because even whether we went there as a school resource officer or Santa Cruz, we're still going to be there for the, same, for the same type of call because they are in this community. You know, it, whether it's a private school or a public school, we still have to, we have a duty to act and protect them. So that's why we're involved there. I'm not saying to deny the service. I'm just saying that maybe there's a way to kind of help them offset some of the problems. <laughs> that's all. And I, I would. <laughs> 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 um, it, it, it broadly, this is Bob Lurlau, sure, town manager. It also broadly falls under what I'd call mutual aid. Uh, for instance, when Barrows had a problem a couple of years ago and had to evacuate, the kids were all sent to Austin Prep. So we have a good back and forth relationship on education and other issues. Um, you know, I know the headmaster, John knows the headmaster, we meet on an infrequent basis. Um, but they're just another aspect of the community that I would call mutual aid, just like another city or town would be. Can I just, Bob, ask that? So I get that and I, I want to be a good neighbor and all, but. But back to when Chief Cormier had that agreement, we're in a different world now, and I go back to bandwidth that we have, the band, even with two re school resource offices, the bandwidth to do that. What happens if something happens at one of our schools and they're up in Austin Prep? That, that's easy, Austin Prep comes second. Yes. <laughs> I mean, that could be a future concern. We'll just have to deal with it as we can. Um, but again, it, it really is a back and forth, if you will, relationship. And quite honestly, we didn't end up sending a regular mock card down there for any call, just as much as we would the school resource officer. So again, they're gonna get the, they're gonna get the, the help. It's just who we send. Any other questions? Yes. Um, Caitlin McCurry, I have two more questions. One, um, you are, video cameras live feed to the police station or do you have to go back and review footage? I'm going to defer to the chief. I need to add your presentation. Um, Joe? They do live feed, correct, if we, if we need them to. However, they are not watched at all 24-7. There's no way, we don't have the power, we don't have the personnel to do that. We, right now, we have, how many cameras? We have, um, well, I don't know if we want to. Yeah, we're not saying that business. Well, we have cameras in all schools. Correct. They can be viewed live, and they can also, they also report on motion. So right. we can go back, and, and there, it has the ability to go back and archive and look at uh, events. But absolutely not right now, are any of them watched, you know, Monitoring from 24 7. I believe you can fix it. Marlene Vita, Joshua, and Karen. So the SRO goes to all nine buildings, including Austin Prep, five days a week, like on a schedule, rotating, or no. how do you split the time? No, I don't know, Brian, if you want to. The majority of times at the high school, to be honest with you. Uh, in the other schools, is more of an as needed basis. Yeah. For example, you were for if Brian Oxley was the first on the scene last Friday uh, uh, for a child when we had the child. Yep. Um, so 
In regard to the youth risk behavior survey, I know we ask kids about drug use. I know we ask them if they're having sex. Can we ask them if they have access to guns? I believe there is. there are questions that ask them, yes. And so might this be something that our CASA branches out to Not add under their umbrella? So currently they're still under the grant, and that would not be one of the goals that we could uh, do under the grant. And here's the problem too. Firearms license to carries are not a public record. So you have, none of us have a, well, I do maybe, but no one else has a right to know who has a license to carry at any house in this town, period. No matter what, that's the truth. That's, that's not a public record whatsoever. Let me do a very high level overview of, of Alice. Uh, we actually were one of the first school districts to implement the Alice protocol um, in Massachusetts. We started with Chief Cormier, the um, school committee, board of selectmen, uh, town managers at the time, um, all worked together to, you know, how can we implement this in, you know, in the um, in the right of public schools. So. We started all the way back in 2013. Um, I believe Officer Biden was the school resource officer with that. <laughs> um, we, we both attended, um, along with other police officers, Alice training. We, we, we have uh, Alice trainers in our, uh, on the police force and in the school district. Um, and we went through a whole series of processes um, to roll out the Alice process both to the community, to staff, um, and having parent workshops and trainings. And annually now we, we do those we do those trainings and with our new teachers, we do a whole Alice training with them to start the school year. Um, so we have been using Alice now for over five years. Um, almost every school district now has this, uh, has this process and protocol in, in place for, uh, for in case there is an intruder in the building. Here are some of the best practices that we do in our schools. We have, as I said before, safety plans and procedures. Um, I already talked about the public safety piece and our school resource officers, our locked doors. We have a whole visitor identification system coming in. We have a lot of communications options available to us, including Blackboard Connect, which we do use um, sparingly, but when, when needed. Um, usually you hear it on snow days, but we, we used it, for example, last, last week with, with the Birch Meadow shelter in place. Um, drills and all of our staff do wear badges during the day, and we've instructed staff that if people aren't wearing badges, then we need to uh, ask them to please go into the main office and get a visitor badge. So obviously, why do we want to have this preparation? Because what we are trying to do is we are trying to, as much as possible, keep everyone alive in our classrooms, in our schools, for a period of about five to six minutes as long as possible. Because that's the time it takes for law enforcement to get to the schools on average and to be able to address a situation. So Alice was put in place so that we could neutralize the situation and keep our students and our staff as safe as possible. And when, when you have a, a, a situation where you're confronted with an emergency, there are really three different um, responses. One is to fight, which is a counter strategy. One is to flight, which is to evacuate. And one is to freeze, which is a lockdown or a shelter in place. And Alice incorporates all three. This has been highly recommended by several organizations, including the Department of Homeland Security, New York Police Department, the International Police Chiefs Association. Um, so this is research-based. This is not some company that was trying to sell it to um, different, different organizations and groups. This is a research-based method, which is always evolving. And what they are constantly doing is they're constantly looking at shooting events, school shootings, and other um, community uh, shootings to see, okay, what is it that we need to do differently with our practices um, so that we can have the most up-to-date training possible. And that's where we work very closely with police and fire um, to, to make those trainings as, um, you know, as up-to-date as possible. 
A big key to this is communication and information because the old way, it used to be one-way communication. We'd get on the loudspeaker, we would tell people, lock down, and we would say something different. When I first came into the Reading Public Schools, the code word um, for something that was happening is that the superintendent was in the building because I guess the superintendent never came into the building. <laughs> so this was a code word for teachers to lock down their doors in case there was an emergency. Um, I hope that's not the case now, but because I'm, I think I'm in schools. But um, but with Alice, there is a there is two-way communication going on at all times. Classrooms actually have the ability to be communicating to public safety. We encourage that if they see someone outside their window that looks suspicious, rather than call the main office who then calls the police, we encourage them to make the phone call to the police, then call the main office. Because we want to get public safety here as quickly as possible. So there is, there is a constant two-way flow of information which is different from previous types of um, methods. The advantages is it integrates technology. We have access in all of our classrooms to technology, both via loudspeaker and computer, and now cell phone. Most people carry a cell phone, so there's the ability to do that. Um, there's improved communication. It gives us options, and the options are going to vary depending on the situation. It's going to vary depending on the location that you are in the building. Um, and it vastly diminishes the odds of the bad guy's success. And that's what we want to do. We want to slow down the, the intruder so that we can get uh, law enforcement and public safety there as quickly as possible. Alice, is, there's five steps. And you do not do these steps necessarily in order. But the five steps are alert, lockdown, inform, counter, and evacuate. And sometimes you do one of the steps, sometimes you do all five. It depends on the situation at hand. And it's a general set of recommendations which people have to make decisions which are best fit for the situation that they're in. So classroom teachers have to make a decision with the information that they have. And a lot of times, the information that they have, if it's minimal, they're going into a lockdown because that's the safest. If they have more information, then they can evacuate and get out of the building. So the first one is alert. Um, and basically we use plain language. When we are doing an alert for a situation, we, do, we use plain language. Um, no codes, it's not a code red or something like that. We want to get the information out there in plain language because that's what people will respond to the best. So what we want to say is instead of lockdown, lockdown, we want to give as much information as possible and say that there is a gunman in, in the admin hallway. So try, if you know the location, to give that location so that people know exactly, I'm in this classroom, I know the intruder could be, is what I'm being told is it's in the opposite part of the building or it's in the classroom right next door. So when you have that information, then you can make a decision as a teacher or as an administrator on what should happen next. The next one is lockdown, that's the L. Um, this is a very good starting point, which is what we tell our, sa our staff. The decision is made either to secure the room or to evacuate. You lock the door, you cover the windows, and you barricade. Um, that's what, or tie down the door, that's what, that's what is part of the drills. Here is uh, former uh, school resource officer Sintowski, now Sergeant Sintowski, um, showing some of the ways that you can barricade in a classroom. Um, you can use tables, you can use a belt, um, because sometimes we have doors that may swing out and would be difficult to, to barricade if they're swinging out into the hallway, or using a whole bunch of desks and chairs, um, file cabinets, things like that. Um, and those are the types of things that we you know, we're a part of our drills, we, we go through these things. The next one is I inform, um, and this is, you know, trying to get as much information throughout the drill as possible. Uh, this is where we use our Blackboard Connect. This is where we're, uh, police are using, um, what's it called, I'm sorry, your, your oh, code, red. code red, thank you. Um, so it could be email, it could be text, it could be phone messages. This is both for inside the classroom and of course with the, with the community. Um, and that information is going to be fluid and, and dynamic. And as much as possible, you give the who, the what, the where, when, and the how. Um, so that everyone is as informed as possible. Um, 
And this is where, as I said before, we use our, our connect edge. C is counter, and it is used only when you have become uh, confronted by the intruder. So if the intruder is in a classroom, this is used as, a, as more of a last resort. And you know, there's, there's certain steps that you take in terms of how you want to disrupt uh, the intruder, throwing things at the intruder, uh, creating as much noise as possible, those, those types of things. So this is something that obviously is only when it's, where it, you're confronted by the intruder. And again, the goal is to get people out of the room and as safe as possible somewhere else. And then finally, evacuate. Evacuate is the best option. Um, and there's always, there's always the fear of, okay, if I evacuate, is there going to be someone outside the building? 2% um, of the cases, research shows, yes, that's the case. The other 98% know that there is not a second intruder or a second person uh, with, a, with a weapon. Um, and obviously, the goal is to remove yourself as quickly from the danger zone as possible. Our staff are trained that they go to a secondary location outside of the building if they're evacuating, um, and that's where the classes know that they, they need to go, where attendance is taken, um, those, those types of things. Um, and if there's any doubt, we tell our staff, lock down, barricade the door um, as much as possible. Uh, the other thing that is part of the training is, you know, because you want to make sure that there, you know, that there isn't any confusion, um, is that you know students are, are going to be leaving that building with their hands you know above their head and so that they can get they can get out safely. Um, so those are the types of things that we teach with with evacuate. And so what you have here is you know a situation where you know it's the the intruder is in one part of the building and so now I have to make a decision um, if I'm in the other part of the building, do I evacuate or do I stay in lockdown? And that's, that's, that's the difference between an Alice and the old lockdown drills that we had several years ago when Columbine first came out. So and as I said earlier, Alice, remember, you do not do it in a linear fashion. And sometimes you only do one or, one or two of the different parts. Um, and communication. Practice and drills are, are really key to the Alice piece, to have students feel as comfortable as possible when they're going through these. Remember, with fire drills, fire drills are routine now, and they've been for many years. And um, you know, one of the statistics is zero students have been killed in fires between 1990 and 2006 because of both the technology in our buildings now, but also the fact that we do a lot of practice and drills four times a year with, with, with fire drills. One of the things that's also important with, with Alice is that we do it in a developmentally appropriate way. So how we do Alice drills with preschool K-1 is much different than what we do with high school students. Uh, so in the preschool K-1, early elementary, even upper elementary, we're using social stories to set the scene, to describe, um, you know, if, if there's a, um, you know, if there's someone coming into the school that, that's, that shouldn't be there and how, how we address it, those types of things. Um, and the training always involves the SRO, and we've also had uh, fire departments been involved, other police officers been involved. There's been times when other communities have come and watched our Alice drills, when they've been uh, learning how to implement it in their schools. So there's a lot of different um, people involved with these drills, and that also um, helps too because you learn from your drills. So if there's something going on, you learn, okay, how can we do this differently next time? So I, sh I should have mentioned at the beginning of the presentation that this is going to be on our website and as part of the website, as part of this presentation, there are several videos, um, training videos that we use which are going to be provided in this. And there are links to several of them. Wilmington Public Schools has a great Alice training video, Walton Public Schools. There's one from middle school, which is called Alice in Wonderland, um, believe it or not, uh, which goes through it in a developmentally appropriate way. Um, Auburn University is probably more of a high school and college level. Um, but there are several videos out there, so we provide the links in the presentation, which will be on our, our website. So we'll stop there for the second round of questions. <coughs> Are metal detectors at all a possibility in the near future for Reading or not even on the conversation at this point? 
Yeah, I don't, I don't know if that's a question that I would feel comfortable answering right now. Because more of it's a safety security. Stephen and Jimmy, so similar to that question of gun detectors, uh, sound, uh, we have video, but do we have sound to help uh, security or first responders pinpoint location, make a snap decision about evacuate or lockdown. If we can quickly, on a fire alarm panel, say the fire is in zone two, you know, the fire department's gonna head, well, what about uh, sound technology, which, which pinpoints the shooter in an instant, and each classroom has a panel, which then can enable them to decide, hey, zone two, we're out of here, zone two, no, we're in lockdown. Fast way. So you're talking other than the sound that we would do on a loudspeaker? The sound of, of a gunshot. Something oh, okay. Something okay. That says, we've got a gunshot. Okay. And you, well, you know, rather than wait for someone to identify and call in, hey, this is where this person is in the hallway, blah, blah, blah. Now we actually know instantaneously, and that would speed up the response for the first responders, but also speed up the response yeah. of evacuation. Uh, for any of the students in classes? So I'm gonna, I'm gonna answer it in generality, not specific to your question. So a lot of the things, what you mentioned and what you mentioned are, are technology that's emerging in this area. Um, certainly we will look at all of those things and that's part, that was all part of the safety and security study when we worked with the security consultant. So I guess I'll leave it at that, that obviously this, tech, this area is emerging right. rapidly. As, as we go along, and that's we're always open to looking at these technologies to see what is feasible to to implement in our schools. Right. Uh, when the docs are yeah. <laughs> <laughs> right. Um, I know you mentioned that the drills happen at all different times in order to get the kids familiar with um, even the most chaotic opportunities, like. Um, wow. the cafeteria, that kind of thing. What's going through my mind is public events at the school, whether it's the field house, whether it's the performing arts center. I'm assuming that part of the student training will lead the adults to know what to do in those situations. Um, are these videos part of what people, parents should look at to become prepared themselves? If there should be something like that, or what kind of, is there, training planned for parents who will be at a play? Or will be so these videos are more for classroom uh, drills. Um, they don't really go into uh, large, large group type uh, evacuations or lockdowns. Um, but the ALICE protocol could still, could still be used. The actual ALICE protocol could still be used. To answer your question. It would be difficult to implement a training. I, I'm trying to think, I'm sorry, I'm thinking a lot. To implement the training in the path for a group of parents who are at an event. That, that I, town meeting. Town meeting, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, you know, obviously there are fire exits in place, there are other things in place. There's, you know, those types of things, but that it would, that type of thing would be difficult to run a training of I think what you're asking. And I guess part of my question then would be, um, and you might not be able to answer this, security in place that would be proactively preventing a situation when an event like that is underway. So screening of people that go through or placement of police officers in the facilities, those kinds of things. That's probably something we can't yeah. discuss. Yeah. Another thing you can't discuss. Um, <laughs> okay. I'm, I'm Mark Doctor. Um, could there be people that are trained in appropriate response that would be at public events? So a, a play that may or may not have police presence. I, I if they're police present, then they then they've, they've been trained. trained. Yes. Right. Fire. Yeah. 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 Just maybe. School officials then. So school officials, okay. So there, it may be possible that at public events there would be one or more people trained. Vanessa Alvarado, a parent of a child in one of the elementary schools. I have two questions. Um, one, what is done um, after these al 
those drills are done in the classrooms or in the schools to debrief children who might be frightened or confused about the actual training. Uh, that's question one. And then question two, regarding the communication to the parents for the recent lockdown that took place um, at the Birch Meadow Fields, I know I received a text message and a call from you, but I know that other parents received different messages and there was some confusion around what was happening when. Um, I don't know if you could speak to perhaps changes in the communication policy coming out of that. So um, the communication went out uh, from me went to everyone that's in our Connect Ed system, which is all, it, it's, it's 5,200 plus, because every, every family has, can use up to five phone calls, three text messages, um, email, I think by email. Um, so I broadcast out to all of those. So it was thousands of messages that went up. Um, I worked very closely that day with Chief Sagawa as to what message, I actually read the message to him before I sent it out to make sure I was consistent with what we wanted to communicate uh, based on the information that we had. So that that message was actually from both you know schools and the police, if you want to say, because it was we collaborated together on that. I know later on a message went out from police um, regarding regarding the situation, and then I think I, I sent out another message when it was when it was stopped. Is there anywhere else that people would be getting communication? And now take this with a grain of salt because it's coming from social media, but. There were people reporting that they had received different information by a text. I don't know where this information may have come from, but... They didn't get it from police or from schools. So no official channels, sorry. No. I do know after the event, uh, the school principals sent something out by email, but that was after the event was well over, and I believe it was uh, later that night. Okay. Because they had, at Birch Meadow, for example, there was an ice cream social that night. So that something went out just before the ice cream social, so parents knew it was okay to come back to the school for the ice cream social. Thank you. But that was an email. Awesome. Thank you. And usually, um, Monica, when we start sticking to the police department, Facebook's website, but unfortunately, everyone that runs that site was at that scene that day, so that's why we didn't get to a Facebook message out, because all the officers that run Facebook were very active that day. So that's what we hope people on Facebook start following what comes from Red. Hi, uh, Andy Friedman, select board and um, proud father of a graduating senior. Congratulations. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> in a little different direction, have, there, have you or the police department looked at um, or studied the impact, if any, of these sorts of drills at places where, where recently where shootings have occurred and have, 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 have they had uh, 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 have they mitigated some of the damage that could have been done? We, we have not. Now usually what happens and I've noticed from other school shootings over the years is that there, like Sandy Hook is a good example. A report came out over a year later um, as to what were the things that worked and what were the things that could have been done differently. So my guess is that will, will be something that will come out at some point, which is usually, I know, is shared with police and usually then also shared with school officials. So those are the, that's the type of research that I was referring to earlier on how you improve the drill practice that you're doing as you look at those. That unfortunately, you use those events um, as ways to improve what you're doing. So it's an iterative. Process. Correct, correct. When we, after Columbine, the whole way both police and schools addressed um, evacuations and lockdowns changed significantly because with Columbine, the practice was, correct me if I'm wrong, that police didn't enter the building before Columbine. And then they learned from that that they probably should. Um, and so that's when all of the different practices started coming about with Alice and and lockdowns and things like that. Thank you. Yes. So, I have a uh, son uh, starting kindergarten. My question is, do you know if there's any available resources for 
parents to know how to appropriately talk to their children about this very real risk? Yeah, that's a, that's a great question. Uh, so the question is, how do you share information with young children um, who are going to be entering school or are in school now um, with, with all the different national situations that happen? So um, we, when we get closer to drills, um, the schools will share information with parents as to what we're talking about. Um, they also post it on the website. But if you also go to the National School Psychologist Association website, there is all kinds of information there on how to talk to children about these types of situations. But the schools, we do send things out well in advance prior to Alice drills um, as to what we're going to be doing and how to talk to your children about it. Uh, so I'd like to hear us talking about sort of different ideas for controls. It has me thinking, one, I want to keep my children safe. At the same time, I don't want them feeling like they're going to school or prison. Mm -hmm. uh, and so I'm curious, as these, as we have the reviews, and as we get maybe some state funding, um, who are the decision makers for which security controls we put in place? Is it the school committee? Is it the two of you, our parents involved? It, it, it's a really good question. Um, there, there has already been in executive session the presentation of some of the highlights of the security piece. So the boards are aware of what what is going on. Um, so it would be using the information from the, the consultant and the security study that was done in our schools as to the plan that will be put in place. Um, the implementation of the plan is done by facilities, us. Um, the actual things that are done, I think, is probably more of a joint recommendation that's mentioned in the folder. But it, it won't, I mean, we'll have to talk about yeah, just add to that, Caitlin. Um, this is the rare exception where it's not public information. So right. town meeting has to effectively trust the four of us uh, that we've made a good choice. It's a very unusual situation that even in executive session, um, we've only shared so much. Um, a little bit more than you're hearing tonight, but not a lot. Um, and there's, there's not a lot of people in this community that have all the information on this for a reason. Um, it's all protected under Homeland Security privacy laws for a good reason. So the town meeting will not have the full discussion should they be the body that needs appropriate funds, I and mean, they most likely would be. Um, if we are able to get the whole thing funded by grants, the town meeting um, effectively would not need to do it, but uh, they have the problem to have. But this is very much, I guess I'll say, a very high level operational area in which the public is not fully brought in for a reason. And so it sounds like we're relying on this, the expertise of this consultant we, we for had a best management practice. Study, absolutely. Um, and I, I would have to say that four of us, if we don't agree, then we'll have to keep talking to them. Move on. So now, um, Chief Scalas and his staff are going to talk about um, active shooter joint training. That's my Hi. So going back to Austin Prep, just so we're on the same page, to what you spoke with my lieutenant. Uh, we are completely reactive over there, just so we're, we know. It's not like here or any of the other schools in Reading that we are proactive as an SRO, but anytime they call us, it's a call we would be getting and be sending an officer to. Period. So just so everyone understands that. Also, this is Lieutenant Christine Amador. She's in charge of our training. And at this point, she's going to go over our active training that we've been doing for many years now. And we included the fire department three years ago to four years ago as well. So, um, Like the chief said, Reading Police has been doing active shooter training for as long as I've been there. And that's uh, going over 12 years. So a few years ago, we thought... Uh, we can't do it alone. We're going to have to work with the fire department in any of these major scenes, so it's best to start training for it. And not only do we have police and fire, we also include our dispatchers in our training, which uh, you'd think is pretty obvious, but it's actually really out of the norm. We're very ahead of our neighbors in this. Um, our active shooter coming up, we've had a lot of our next door neighbors actually reach out to us and ask if they could start being involved to see what we do so they could start playing for their community. Um, 
Our mission, the police mission, is to train and prepare Reading police officers in the best practices when there is an active shooter situation within the town of Reading. And our goal, our ultimate goal is to end the shooting as soon as possible. Um, so like the column, there's no more waiting, there's no more minimum numbers of teams of officers going in. Every Reading police officer knows as soon as they get there, they may be on their own and they're going to go right in. Um, and our ultimate goal is to save as many lives as possible by evacuating casualties to medical care and escorting medical personnel in to begin treatment on patients. And this right here, this shows what I'm talking about. We escort. Uh, in the front is a police officer. The three personnel in the middle are firefighters and the person in the rear is a police officer. So no longer do we wait until basically we feel the entire building is clear of any harm. We now feel if we can get the fire department in with us, they can start medical care and start evacuating immediately while providing them some police security. Um, the fire department's mission is also to train the firefighters in the best practices when there is an active shooter. Uh, their goals is to provide tactical emergency medical care to casualties, uh, prepare ambulatory services, and coordinate with the hospitals. Um, besides myself, Captain Rick Nelson from the fire department, he's a very uh, huge piece to this. Everybody here on this list has expertise, whether it's in extra medical care, uh, most of the police officers are the firearms instructors, everybody here is trained in incident command systems, and everyone here has just a little bit more expertise when it comes to uh, clearing rooms and shootings. Um, before we do our mission every year, we also have a supervisor training. This is one of the past pictures of some uh, other supervisors with police and fire. So before we get out there and actually practice it, we do it on paper. Um, how we prepare. Each active shooter drill, we have one coming up in June. It takes us pretty much 11 months to start the next year because we really uh, work hard at it. We um, have monthly to bi-monthly meetings between police and fire. We look at recent trends of real life active shootings to decide what our main training priorities will be. Um, school, active shooter doesn't only happen in schools, that's actually the minimum. It's not one of the most sought at places for active shooters. So we train in all different places. We, we do like to pick our schools because we like to know the layout of the schools, but we've also done training at Camp Curtis, um, at the Market Basket buildings and office buildings as well. This year we're going back to a school. We'll be at the Killam School. Uh, the police officers here do a minimum of 16 hours of shooting a year. Uh, we do a lot of close quarter training practice. Uh, that's pretty much what would happen in an active shooter engagement. Um, on our training day, we come up with about two to three large scale training exercises of an active shooter. And we start it from front to back, and uh, it's going to be at the Killam Elementary School. We're going to focus on police contact movements, police and fire rescue task force, and the school reunification process. That's going to be new for us this year. Um, usually, once we have everybody taken care of and evacuated, we end. This year we want to see what would happen with all the students. So we actually have live actors coming from all different parts of town. Um, the Boy Scouts are helping us out. So we can see how we're going to deal with actually having all these students running at us during an active shooter and where we're going to put them. And then how the school's process of getting them reunified with their parents. Um, so that's a big step we're taking to this year, um, as I was just saying. Um, and after each training scenario, we conduct an after action review. We go over what went well, what we could improve upon. Um, that's really it for that. Uh, anybody has any questions of our training? Okay. Oh, yes. Will the neighborhoods be notified? Yes. Uh, we'll put out our message boards sure, uh, probably the week before, all around Killam, and also send out a code red message um, to Killam as well. Yes. Um, so Killam is important, but lots of people drive to, down Haverhill and Charles Street, so the message boards will be out. Will there also be a blast that goes to the town? Uh, we can put out one up to the whole town. There'll be an um, exercise that day, sure. But we will use all four message boards to make sure everyone knows it's just an exercise. Because we will actually be at St. Anthanasius Church as well. Um, they're allowing us to use their facilities for what we need, um, some of our staging area. Thank you. So we um, wanted to see if there are any other questions you have at this point. This is really the end of our presentation for this evening. Any other thoughts or questions? We're more than happy to answer them at this time. Yes, sure. Uh, Mike's just a comment. I'm sure you've had to have from a school committee member. And I just really want to thank everybody who presented tonight and for the work you do together. 
seeing that you'll go into a building while there's still a shooter in there to keep people safe and to rescue kids. And it's, it's really moving to me. So thank you all. I know that Alice drove our court in the building should an intruder come in the building, but why not when all the kids are at recess and they can access the property from parking lots or someone's backyard? So I don't know my question is that so um, the best way to explain that is that when people go when students and staff go outside the building, they do carry communication with them in terms of walkie talkie. So they are able to communicate with with the office. So that communication is happening, and if there is something going on, they'll be, you know, obviously calling the office, and we'll take it from there. Is there one walkie-talkie out there, or a few? Do you know? I mean, you don't know, but right? uh, I honestly have to come ahead. Do not. We do have we do have several walkie-talkies at each school <coughs> that are accessible to staff. class Kathy and Jamia teach first grade at Joshua Eaton. So just to answer that further, as classroom teachers, we carry our cell phones outside of us. So um, we can call that and create to do what John was talking about. Linda. Um, my question is about identifying proactively potential threats. Um, there are there I know you said that there's limitations as to what can be done with social media but if you get um, students report something so is there a process that you go through to follow through on who might be a potential threat it has to do also with my suspension question we have a protocol in place that it, and it could be a variety of it could be a student it could be graffiti that we see in a on the wall, the building, um, the social media, we have a protocol in place. I, that's really as far as I know. Thank you. Okay. Thank, you. Thank you very much, everyone.